Welcome for everybody joining us. My name is Kimberly Meck. Uh, we're going to give people a few more minutes to get on. Not a few more minutes, a few more seconds to get on. So my name is Kimberly Meck. I am the executive director of the Alliance of People with Disabilities. I am a white female uh, with a blue patterned tank top on and I have my sunglasses on top of my head. My pronouns are she and her. I am going to allow Robin to introduce herself. Thanks, Kimberly. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Robin Tatsuda. I'm executive director at the ARC of King County. I identify as a biracial cisgendered female using she, her pronouns. Uh, I have um, sort of, I guess, olive-ish colored skin, uh, dark, short hair. Uh, I'm wearing uh, headphones with a little microphone and a black uh, v-neck t-shirt sitting in sort of a large room with miscellaneous things behind me. Uh, welcome. Thanks, Robin. I'm going to go over some housekeeping and some accessibility considerations. Uh, we're recording this session so that we can post it to the King County Disability Consortium website. The URL is www.kingcountydisability.org forward slash webinars, and we will put that in chat. Captions are available in Zoom. Click show subtitle in your Zoom menu bar to turn them on. Captions are also running at streamtext.net. That URL is too long to read, but we'll paste it into the chat. Streamtext allows you to enlarge the font and change the color and contrast of the captioning. There's also a chat feature on Streamtext, so you're welcome to submit questions or comments there, and we will monitor them and voice any questions during Q&A breaks. ASL interpreters are available today. Yes, this is live captioned, Elizabeth, sorry. <laughs> ASL interpreters are available today. We are presenting in gallery view, so the interpreter should always be visible. You do not need to pin them. Please know that we have two interpreters. So if you pin the current interpreter, it could prevent you from seeing the active interpreter after an interpreter change. We will be sharing videos in a PowerPoint today. If you need access to the ASL interpreters during the videos, you will need to be in side-by-side -side mode. When the video or PowerPoint begin, you will see a menu bar that says you are viewing host names screen. Click view options and select side by side view. This will allow you to see the PowerPoint and the interpreters at the same time. If you're using dual screens, you might want to click optimize for dual screens. You can adjust the size of the PowerPoint and interpreters by using the slider feature in the middle of the screen. We do not recommend joining by mobile or tablet uh, Excuse me, sorry. We do not recommend joining by mobile or tablet if you want to see the interpreters and PowerPoint at the same time. You can swipe left on most mobile and tablets to change your view, though. You do not need to be on Zoom to access this event. We will read all questions aloud and voice any images on the screen so that the content will be available to individuals calling in on the phone or who, or who cannot see visual content. We will have a brief question and answer period after one of our presentations. Please use the Q&A tab for any questions, and please use the chat tab for general conversations and comments. Cart chat stream text will be used for both questions and comments. And also please note, we will use both person with a disability and disabled person interchangeably, recognizing different people's preferences for person first or identity first language. Sorry, I put my paper in front of the screen. I apologize. I can't memorize all of that. No worries, Kimberly. This is Robin again. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me orient you all to this event. Uh, some may already know, but this is our seventh session of our Understanding Ableism monthly series. These events are hosted by the King County Disability Consortium, which is composed of over 30 different disability serving organizations and individual disability advocates and activists. These understanding ableism events are led by the disability community, promoting disability justice within the King County enterprise. For those of you that don't know, July 26th marked the 31st anniversary since the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, often known as the ADA. 
Here with us today, we have King County Council members sharing some exciting news, as well as the Northwest ADA Center to discuss the impacts of the ADA. From there, we'll hear from the uh, King County Office of Equity and Social Justice about the county's commitment to people with disabilities. First, before we jump in, I actually am excited to share a, a short video. Uh, several members of our community have um, sent videos that uh, discuss the ADA and the personal impacts it's had on their lives. So before we jump in, as a reminder again, if you need access to the ASL interpreters during the video, you'll need to be in the side-by-side -side mode to see both interpreters and the video. When the video begins, you will see a menu bar that says, quote, you are, use, you are viewing host names screen. Click the view options and select side-by-side -side view. This will allow you to see both the video and the interpreters at the same time. So go ahead with the video. Seattle has always been a very progressive city with things changing all the time. And I want most public places to be accessible. My mom moved to Olympia a little while ago and she made sure that the place she moved to would be accessible just for my sake. And if she can do something like that, you can do it too. So it never hurts to advocate for yourself. That's always a very good idea. And of course, the ADA will always be very important. My name is Doreen Cornwell. I am a resident, a customer, a voter, a transit rider, an employee, an employer, a participant in the faith community, tricky point, an optimist about room for everyone in our communities. The ADA enshrines in law civil rights of people with many different disabilities to full inclusion and participation in all aspects of life. Um, laundry facilities and multifamily housing so wheelchair users can do their own laundry, lifts and ramps for buses so people can get around, tactile input on point of sale devices so I can spend money without having to share sensitive credit information. The uh, the ADA is important steps on the road to full inclusion. Hi, my name is Jason Todd Morris. I'm a first person self advocate for people with developmental disabilities. You see, I was born with developmental disabilities in reading, writing, and arithmetic. I was in special ed K through 12 in a segregated classroom. I rode the short bus to school. And when I graduated, under Division for Vocation Rehab, I had a chance to go to college. Access to higher education is a vital part of the ADA broader social promise to promote equal access and full participation in all aspects of U.S. society. July marks the 31st anniversary of the signing of the ADA into law. I am here in King County in the county-wide celebration of the ADA. Let's do it! Those videos bring me so much joy. Uh, I'm also really very excited um, to introduce our next two guests. We have King County Council Member Jeannie Colwells from District Four with us today. Uh, we also were supposed to have Council Member Gurmay Zahalai uh, from uh, District 2. Uh, unfortunately, he is sick today, but luckily his Chief of Staff, Rhonda Lewis, is here in his stead, and we are thrilled to have you both. So welcome, Council Member Cole Wells and Ms. Lewis. I'm so excited for what you have to share next. Hey, well, thank you very much, uh, Robin and Kimberly. I'm really delighted to be here. And I am Jean Cole Wells. I use the she, her pronouns. I'm a white woman with blonde hair, getting older and wearing glasses, sitting on a comfortable brown chair in my living room in Belltown and wearing a black summer blouse with flowers on it. Can you all see me okay for those 
who are doing that? Anyways, I have the honor of serving as the King County Council Member for Council District 4, which is all within the city of Seattle from Madison Avenue to the south to 145th to the north and most of the area between the Sound and I-5. So we're talking about Northwest Seattle as well as Belltown, uh, South Lake Union, Queen Anne, Magnolia, Ballard, Interbay, Finney, Green Lake, uh, Fremont, Wallingford, and Bitter Lake. Today, I'm pleased to be joining Council Member, well, Council Member Zahalai's wonderful Chief of Staff, Rhonda Lewis, in reading this proclamation in honor of Disability Pride Day. Before we go directly into reading the proclamation, I'd like to take a moment to thank this community and this event series. As a whole, Understanding Ableism has been an incredibly valuable and important series and has lift, excuse me, lifted up so many voices within the disability community to highlight a broad range of experiences. Beyond, beyond that, the work of the groups and individuals here, including the King County Disability Consortium, has been central to advancing disability equity work at King County. Accessibility is something that my colleagues at, and I at the Council care deeply about. In fact, a long time ago, I worked with the US Department of Education in the late 1970s through the mid 80s in working with school districts and implementing the 1973 Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and Title IX and Title VI pertaining to gender and race and national origin uh, discrimination uh, of the 1972 education amendments to the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So this goes back way further than the ADA, but the ADA was really the, the huge step forward. I understand that a proclamation does not solve many of the pressing inequities that are faced by individuals with disabilities, but I do hope that you take this as a symbol of my continued commitment to work with everybody to advance disability equity at King County and also to dismantle systems of oppression and continue to work toward a county that is really accessible for everybody. And uh, thank you again for having my, me here. And I'm very honored to join you in this celebration. And then we will have the proclamation, but Rhonda, I'm wondering if you have a few words to say before we begin. Thank you, council member Colwells. My name is Rhonda Lewis. I am a black female. I have a short Afro hairdo. I am a cisgender female. I use she, her pronouns. I am wearing a blue and white abstract patterned dress, black headphones with a small microphone. Council member Zahalai really wanted to be here tonight and I extend um, regrets on, on his behalf. If I had to sum up the, the kinds of actions that Council Member Zahalai has done this year, it would be helping those who have been historically ignored or whose voices haven't, heard, haven't been heard, amplifying those voices and um, creating a platform for them to be heard. Our district shares a border with Council Member Cole Wells's district. We work on many things jointly and this commitment to equity and social justice and the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as not just compliance with the ADA, but going beyond compliance and into actions that help everyone in our county be included and enjoy the beauty of this county that we call home. So I thank you for allowing me to be here. With that, I'm just gonna go into the proclamation. Whereas in 1973, section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act became the first 
federal civil rights protection for people with disabilities and Whereas this protection served as the foundation for the Americans with Disabilities Act, signed into law by President George H.W. Bush on July 26, 1990, to ensure and protect the civil rights of people with disabilities. And this year marks the 31st anniversary of its signing. And? Whereas the ADA, established a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities and expanded choices for people with disabilities by reducing barriers, changing perceptions, and increasing full participation in community life. And whereas Ableism as a systemic barrier that overtly and subversively works against people with disabilities in housing, employment, public accommodations, and society. And whereas members of the BIPOC and LGBTQIA communities with disabilities face the compounded intersectional effects of ableism racism, sexual orientation discrimination, and gender expression discrimination, and? Whereas the COVID-19 pandemic brought forth unprecedented challenges and hardships to our communities and especially to people with disabilities, and? Whereas the executive and the King County Council are committed to working with community and county employees to ensure that equitable anti-ableist policies become actionable pillars of all county operations as advancing disability equity and inclusion reflect King County government's core value of making our county a welcoming community where all can thrive and Whereas the full promise of the ADA requires continued commitment to fully implement the ADA, beginning with the executive and council's recommitment to this work through King County's Disability Action Plan. Now, therefore, and I'll say we on behalf of council member Zahalai, the Metropolitan King County Council and the King County Executive proclaim July 26, 2021 as Disability Pride Day in King County. As we celebrate and recognize the progress that has been made, reaffirm the principles of disability access, equity, and inclusion, and recommit our efforts to reaching and going beyond full ADA compliance. This was dated this 20th day of July, 2021, and signed by all nine King County Council members and the King County Executive, Dow Constantine. Wow. Thank you so much, Council Member Cole Wells and Zahalai's Chief of Staff, Rhonda Lewis. I honestly, like, I'm a little teary. I'm not going to lie. My heart is full. Uh, you sharing this proclamation uh, really, truly is, has brought me so much joy. And I know that this is so meaningful across the disability community. Thank you so much for joining us to share it with us in real time uh, and for your leadership and helping support this proclamation uh, to be part of our King County community. Thank you. And Robin, if I could just say thank you for, again, for inviting us, but I want to make sure everybody knows that we did read this at our council meeting last week on July 20th. So people who were tuned into that, to that meeting, which is pretty widespread and on King County TV, um, heard the resolution as well. The proclamation. Wonderful. 
Thank you again so Thank much. You. Thank you. And two additional council members wanted to join us but were not available tonight, but they were able to make some real short little videos uh, for us. So uh, we're gonna take a moment to, to listen to council member Dave Up the Grove from District 5, and then also council member Kathy Lambert from District 3. It's an honor to be part of the Understanding Ableism series. My name is Dave Up the Grove, King County Council member from South King County. About 10 years ago, my father unexpectedly lost his vision. He went blind. And one summer recently, I set my alarm clock for 4.30 in the morning, scooped up my dad, and we drove up to Seattle, and we jumped into the cold water of Lake Washington and swam a half a mile. Then we got on a tandem bicycle, a bicycle built for two, and we pedaled 12 and a half miles. And then with my dad at my side, we ran a 5K, and my father, at age 75 and blind, successfully completed Seattle's Seafair Triathlon. And as we came across the finish line that morning, I realized my dad was demonstrating a powerful truth. And it is this, working together, we can overcome any obstacle. That's why this week at the King County Council, we're honoring uh, the 31st anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act with a proclamation honoring disability pride. But there is so much more work to do here in King County. Uh, there's so many more barriers to overcome. And the great Reverend Desmond Tutu once said, hope is being able to see the light despite the darkness. And these are dark times. We've been ravaged by a global pandemic. Our economy has suffered. We are more polarized politically than ever. But I have hope that our values will succeed. And those values are simple. It's a belief that all people, regardless of our differences, have value, have something to contribute, and deserve equal rights and fair treatment. And working together, that's what I hope we can achieve. So thanks for letting me be a part of this. And happy 31st anniversary of the ADA. Hi, I'm Kathy Lambert. I'm the King County Council Member for District 3. And I appreciate the opportunity to provide a few comments today. Thank you for joining today's Understanding Ableism event to recognize and to celebrate the 31st anniversary of the passage of the American Disabilities Act, known as the ADA. This landmark legislation was signed into law by President George H.W. Bush and was a huge step forward to provide civil rights protections and expand access to people with disabilities. It not only helped reduce barriers, but it also led to a change in perceptions and increased participation in the community for all people. King County is home to approximately 563,000 people with disabilities. They are our valued friends, our neighbors, our family, and our coworkers. Disabilities come in all shapes and sizes and span throughout every demographic. About five years ago, I spent 14 weeks in a wheelchair and came to more clearly appreciate what it means to have sidewalk cutouts and handlebars and restrooms. It's important that we support people with disabilities and we listen to what they have to say so we can become more inclusive. We must strive to identify and counteract ableism that continues to exist in our society. King County has heard the disability community and will continue to work towards moving beyond even the ADA Act. We are committed to disability access, equity, and inclusion. Thanks again for being part of today's great event. And thank you for the incredible work the Alliance for People with Disabilities is doing to serve and empower the residents of King County. Thank you and congratulations. This is Robin again. Uh, again, I cannot express my gratitude enough. Uh, thank you so much to council members Zahalai, Colwells, Up the Grove, and Lambert. Uh, truly, uh, my gratitude and I think collectively our gratitude from the King County Disability uh, Consortium uh, for your leadership in ensuring that King County recognizes and is committed to the needs of the disability community uh, just cannot be expressed enough. This is, this is so valuable and means so much to hear from each of you. So thank you. Moving along in our program, uh, I'm excited to introduce to you our next guest. 
uh, Lynn, uh, sorry, Linda Clement Carp, uh, MFA and ADAC, is a continuing education specialist and interim assistant director at the Northwest ADA Center, which is one of 10 regional centers of the ADA National Network. At the Northwest ADA Center, Linda serves as lead trainer and curriculum developer on the ADA and other disability related topics, presenting both regionally and nationally. Linda holds an MFA from the University of California, Fullerton, and is a certified ADA coordinator, as well as an American Bar Association trained paralegal. The Northwest ADA Center supports the intent of the ADA by assisting businesses, state and local governments, and individuals as they navigate the process of changing our culture to provide access, opportunity, and inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of public life. So Linda, welcome. We're so glad you're here and we're excited to learn with you uh, uh, tonight. Thank you, Robin. I'm really excited to be here and I feel very honored to be here right now. Um, it was an interesting thing to be asked to, to talk about the ADA to a group that is really so very well-educated to begin with. Um, and so Kayla and I spoke about what actually would be the, the best way to go about it. And, you know, how much do people know, um, you know, so what I decided was to start at the beginning. And the beginning is, my name is Linda Clement Carp, and um, Robin already introduced me. I'm from Northwest ADA Center. I have brown curly hair that has a white streak in it and is up, uh, up today because I'm hot and I'm wearing a blue shirt and um, my pronouns are she, her. And I'm gonna, gonna get started on this presentation. Basically, um, it, this is the ADA 31 years looking back and moving forward where we've been, where we're going. Uh, the first slide has an image of uh, multicolored silhouettes of people with various disabilities. Um, so what we're looking at right now is understanding 31 years of the ADA. From a young age, we are told that America stands for freedom and equality and opportunity and everybody can achieve anything they set their minds to is the American dream, right? Um, but historically in our country, people with disabilities were not included in that. They were the others. Um, and um, so being second class citizens is where we're coming from. Um, at best, we were worthy of charity and pity, and at worst, we were hidden away, sterilized, or even allowed to die. So today, we're going to talk about where we were and how we got here um, and sort of a legal, the legal um, course of actions that came uh, from back in the 1800s to where we actually got to be today. And then what's the purpose of the ADA, the impact of the ADA, and then how do we reinforce the intent of the ADA? What's next? What, what goes beyond here? Where do we go from here? So before the ADA, um, I, I'm not gonna go into every single bit of uh, American law, but um, there were ugly laws, that is what they were called, from about the 1860s all the way through the 1970s. And uh, on this slide, there's an image of a man who is on crutches. Um, and there are two people next to him. One is a policeman and they are, these two men are leading him uh, away from the Skid Row area in, uh, in Chicago. This is in 1954 that this image was taken. The ugly laws meant that um, people with disabilities were not supposed to be seen in public. Um, this is from a, a Chicago uh, ordinance. Any person who is diseased, maimed, mutilated, or in any way deformed so as to be an unsightly or disgusting object 
shall not expose himself to public view under the penalty of a fine of not less than $1, nor more than $50 for each offense. A dollar back then was more than $25 today. So we're talking about over $1,200 as a maximum fine for being seen in public. This also in many um, cities applied to people with uh, intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities. It was not just people with physical disabilities. So um, that's where we were back then. Um, and uh, it was basically about the, the evils of, and the drain on society that uh, the American culture kind of how it, how the American culture saw people with disabilities within it. Um, as time progressed in the 1900s, we started getting into American eugenics laws. Uh, there's an image on this slide of a bunch of men um, in bowler hats and one is holding up a sign that says, would the prisons and asylums be filled if my kind had no children? And the other says, I cannot read this sign by what have I, by what right have I children? And um, basically, so this was a time when eugenics became really um, popular in the United States and actually America kind of led the world in having laws that were, that, uh, were based in the theory of eugenics. Eugenics being that we can create better, quote unquote, better people if we can, uh, keep people who have disabilities or who have, or who are, who are not racially quote unquote pure and other sorts of people from reproducing or eventually do away with them. Um, so 1907, we started having uh, eugenic sterilization laws in the United States. The first one was in Indiana. And the, the, the reason was to prevent the procreation of confirmed criminals, idiots, imbeciles and rapists. Uh, from procreating. Um, and this is, um, these laws were passed in, I think, 37 of the United, of the states in the United States. And um, there was uh, in 1915, and so that's the first, the eugenic laws was in 1907. In 1915, um, passive euthanasia of infants uh, who were born with uh, some kind of a disability was basically approved um, when there was a big case, baby Bollinger, who uh, was born uh, needing surgery. A surgeon was brought in. The surgeon happened to be a eugenics follower. Um, and he convinced the family that they'd be better off if they let the baby just die and not have the surgery. So after five days without nutrition um, and with no medical assistance, that baby died. There, was, there were no repercussions for the doctor. In fact, he went around the country and did it for several other families and um, made a movie about himself called The Black Stork. It was quite popular in the eugenics movement about how much better it could be for every family if they had a child with a disability, if they just let it die, it would be the humane thing to do. And then they could go on and have a baby that didn't have a disability and wouldn't everyone be happy. Um, <laughs> in 1927, um, there was the Buck v. Bell case, which upheld at the Supreme Court level that states have a right to forcibly sterilize people with disabilities. Um, the, the quote from um, uh, Justice uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes in relation to that case was, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute de uh, degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their own imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. Um, the reason why I'm going over this bit is that this is all law. This is not, um, this is not just societal attitudes. This is actually what the laws were before the ADA and other civil rights laws. In uh, 1953, there were non-consensual radiation experiments on uh, some boys at um, a school for the quote unquote mentally retarded, the Walter F. Ferndale State School. A hundred children um, with their parents' permission joined a science club and they would get special extra treats and outings for for being in the science club and they got a special breakfast every morning 
that had certain vitamins in it and they would have their blood drawn to see the effect of the vitamins. Well, it turned out that um, they were being fed radioactive calcium and radioactive iron in their oatmeal every morning. And the, they were, this was from 1946 to 1953. This lawsuit was not settled until 1997, seven years after the ADA was passed. Um, that Buck v. Bell ruling um, on forced sterilization actually still stands in the United States. There aren't any states that, that have a forced sterilization law anymore. However, because, because it was never a challenge at the Supreme Court following that ruling, the stance is still uh, uh, that forced sterilization is legal in this country based on the Constitution. Um, so in 1918 to 1920, this is when things started getting better. It was concurrent with some things that were going badly too, but so we had the first of our Rehabilitation Act. Um, in uh, 1918, we had the Soldiers Rehabilitation Act, which provided voc rehab for veterans after World War I. And then two years later, the Civilian Rehabilitation Act, which extended those services to all Americans with physical disabilities. There's an image here of um, some men working in a shop. It's an old newspaper clipping. Um, and uh, it says, future ship workers, disabled men are taught oxyacetylene welding in the Red Cross Institute for Crippled and Disabled Men, New York City. So um, this was the way that uh, they were trying to get people back into the workforce instead of hiding people away like the ugly laws were doing, even though the ugly laws were also still in existence at the same time. Um, in 1935, we had the Social Security Act. Uh, the League of the Physically Handicapped in New York City actually um, was formed to protest discrimination in the, the, um, the Works uh, Progress Administration. And so eventually they were able to get the Social Security Act passed, which provides income maintenance to people with disabilities who've contributed to Social Security through their earnings and to people who are unable to work. Uh, there's an image here of a man who um, has a prosthetic hand and he is doing some sort of work with a with a big canister. Um, and the the it's a poster and it reads, America needs all of us hire the handicapped through state employment service local offices. 1964 was a huge step forward. The Civil Rights Act um, outlawed discrimination and segregation based on race, color, religion, and gender, but people with disabilities were still excluded until 1988. There's a photo here of um, President Lyndon B. Johnson uh, at the Signing Act, surrounded by a bunch of men, and uh, President Johnson is shaking the hand of Martin Luther King Jr. 1965, we got the Voting Rights Act and we got Medicare and Medicaid. This is a huge step forward. The Voting Rights Act meant that people with disabilities can get assistance voting in elections. There's a, there's a poster here from the time that says, with rights comes responsibility. The National Voter a Education Act makes it easier to register to vote. Register to vote now. Americans with disabilities vote national office. And um, that the poster has an image of two people side by side in voting booths. And at the bottom uh, under the curtain, you can see that one person, you can see his legs and then the other curtain um, on, at the bottom of it, you can see the wheels of a wheelchair. Also at the time, Medicare and Medicaid were created that year, 1965. It subsidized healthcare to people with disabilities and older Americans. 1968 came the Fair Housing Act. It was a great thing. It passed on the day that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. It wasn't supposed to pass, but because of that having happened on that day, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, pressured everyone to make sure that that did pass. However, it did not include people with disabilities. Um, 
The same year, 1968, the Architectural Barriers Act was passed, which ensured physical access to uh, federally funded buildings. They had to be built to be accessible. There's an image here of a wheelchair uh, sort of tipped on a curb. 1973 was the Rehabilitation Act. It was finally passed, but only just sort of. Um, Section 504 currently prohibits discrimination by recipients of federal financial assistance. But what happened was that um, it needed a bunch of regulations to be created. And until they were signed off by the US um, Health and Human Services Secretary, I think, I'll, I'll get it one second, uh, it, couldn't be, it couldn't actually be enforced. So Section 504 spent three years being completely inactive, not being enforced, not being implemented. Um, lots of people were trying to get it rewritten so that the regulations would be less comprehensive. Um, and that led to, let's see if we get there now, not quite. 1975, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which was originally called Education of All Handicapped Children Act. It's now called IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It ended separate unequal education for any public schools that were accepting federal funds. It uh, created free public education with children for children with disabilities, educational plans with parents' input, and it was supposed to mirror the experience of children who were not disabled. Um, and there is an image on this of uh, two children side by side, each is in a wheelchair, they're at a protest. One has a sign behind him that reads, I'm in mainstream school. The other one has a sign behind her that reads, why am I not in mainstream school? 1973 to 1977, there was a huge push to enforce section 504. On this slide, there are two images. Judy Human is actually at the front of both of these images, but the first one, she's at the front of a group. Uh, many of them are using wheelchairs and her sign reads, no more negotiation, sign 504. The other image is a group of activists all carrying, all with different signs. Um, and uh, again, Judy Human is sort of leading the way there. So all this time, that had gone by since 1973 and 504 hadn't been passed. So there was a huge push to actually get it passed. And so what ended up happening was a bunch of, uh, a bunch of people all over the country started protesting um, led by people with disabilities. And um, people with disabilities actually took over the San Francisco federal building um, on April 5th, 1977, to, to say that they were not going to wait anymore. They wanted 504 passed. They wanted it without any changes. Stop trying to get it rewritten. Pass it. Um, for 28 days at the San Francisco Federal Building, this group of people with disabilities occupied that building. It was the longest occupation of a federal building in US history. And that was by people with disabilities, for people with disabilities to force an act that was for the benefit of people with disabilities to be enacted and to be enforced. Eight of those people went on hunger strike. There were 150 in all in the building. Um, and they were assisted by lots of other civil rights groups. The Black Panthers came in regularly to provide food. Um, finally, um, on April 28th, 1977, the Section 504 regulations were issued without any rewrites. Um, they were finally passed. And uh, in 1978, the Rehabilitation Act were, was amended to include federal funding for independent living centers. Um, this was something that Ed Roberts, who is considered the father of independent living, uh, really, really worked to, to make happen basically for, for the whole decade before this passed, longer than that, actually. He's in the, a photo on this um, slide, 
And behind him, there is a sign that reads civil rights for disabled. So um, this basically established the, the, um, the SILs and the federal funding for independent living centers. It also provided VR grants to Native American tribes. Um, and so now we're in 1986, 1986, 1988, we're trying to carve a path from the Federal Rehabilitation Act, which meant, which gave everybody, anyone who received federal funding had to provide equal uh, or equitable service um, to those with disabilities. Well, but that didn't, that did not cover areas of public life. It didn't cover um, state and local governments. It only covered places that get federal funding. So um, from 1986 to 88, Justin Dart, who's considered the godfather of the ADA, um, went around the country holding these town halls and got input from people um, about the obstacles that they faced um, as people with disabilities. It resulted in a, um, a report called Towards Independence. And then the National Council on Disability drafted that into the initial version of the ADA. It had bipartisan sponsorship. Tom Harkin, Ted Kennedy, Bob Dole were all behind it. Um, however, legislators obstructed it um, on the basis of complaints about the cost because, because businesses did not want to want it passed because of the cost on them, objections about overreach by religious groups, and then attempts to exclude people with AIDS. Um, all of these and other reasons um, created a real roadblock to it actually getting passed. Finally, um, in uh, 1988, um, the ADA did pass, but was not signed yet because it didn't go to the Senate. The Senate obstructed it more. So um, let's let's just see what happens next. Hang on. Um, let's see what's going on here. Okay, the AD. This is there's a typo on this. The ADA is going to happen here. So hold on. Um, the Fair Housing Amendments Act was in 1988. Um, it added protections for people with disabilities. That was the amendments. Finally, after, uh, after many years, we got the added protection for people with disabilities. There's a logo on here for equal housing opportunity with a house and an equal sign and uh, the symbol for wheelchair access. Um, and uh, it required that a certain number of accessible housing units in every new multifamily house, uh, housing, both public and private, be accessible. So here we are now, what's really going on with the ADA. 1990 was the Capitol crawl. Um, there had been a full year of demonstrations to get the ADA passed through the Senate. And on March 13th, there were huge demonstrations in Washington, D.C., over a thousand people came and about 50 people with disabilities left wheelchairs and other um, mobility aids at the bottom of the steps of the Capitol and climbed up. Um, there, there are two photos here. One, they're both of uh, an eight-year-old girl named Jennifer Keelan Chaffins, who was the youngest person to crawl the steps that day. She had been a disability activist actually for many years and had already been arrested at the age of six for protesting. Um, she, there's a photo of her climbing up the steps, surrounded by photographers, people watching her, people handing her drinks. And then there's another photo of her with her mother at the top um, being hugged and she is smiling, having finally made it to the top. It took hours and hours to get to the top. Um, this public display was an embarrassment to the senators and they finally passed the ADA, um, and then on um, July 26th in uh, 1990, uh, President George H.W. Bush signed the ADA, saying that the shameful wall of exclusion finally come tumbling down. There's a photo of him here on the South Lawn of the White House with the White House in the background. 
Um, he is signing the ADA. Um, he is surrounded by um, Evan Kemp and the Reverend Harold Wilk, um, as well as Justin Dart, our godfather. Um, the, the ADA was modeled after the Civil Rights Act and the Federal Rehab Act, and it filled in to all of public areas, including state and local government and all commerce and all business, all of those civil rights that were afforded to other people through the Civil Rights Act and the Federal Rehabilitation Act's rights that it gave to people with disabilities. It provided just more comprehensive protection of civil rights, and it was based on the principles of inclusion, integration, accessibility, and accommodation. So here's how it works. <laughs> um, for those of you who aren't super familiar, uh, the ADA has five titles. Uh, Title I covers employment, and any employers with 15 or more employees uh, have to provide um, a reasonable accommodations and, uh, and have to provide a non-discriminatory work environment for people with disabilities. Um, every state differs, but one thing that's important about the ADA is that the ADA prohibits any state from passing laws that are less, that are more restrictive than the ada but laws can pass uh, states can pass laws that give broader protections than the ada so for instance here in washington that number is eight or more employees rather than the ada's 15. title ii is public services that means state and local government programs services facilities all we're talking about access inclusion in all and not separate but equal, but rather integrated. Places of public accommodation, that's business and commerce. It means that a business cannot deny you service because you have a disability. Telecommunications, this is where we got relay services, TTY and captioning of public service announcements. Um, and they're, they're all uh, enforced by various agencies. The EEOC does Title I, DOJ does Titles II and III, FCC Title IV, and then Title V is miscellaneous. And the best part of Title V is that there is no such thing as reverse discrimination. I like that. Um, now, the ADA considered um, anyone who uh, has a disability, has a history of disability, or is regarded as having a disability to be covered by this ADA. Um, be, to be regarded as someone with disability might be someone who has facial scarring and people look at them and think they have a disability and can they, so they end up getting discriminated against because they look like they might have a disability. Um, but then there was a the fight for enforcement. And we have two images here of some of the, some of the protests that went on um, in the four years that it took to actually roll out the ADA. Um, there's an ADAPT protest in Las Vegas in 1994. It's a tightly packed group of protesters and many of them are in wheelchairs. Um, signs that say no more pity and freedom now. In the center of the photo is an American flag and instead of where the stars usually go, there are sh there's a, um, the, the sign of the wheelchair made up in stars. And uh, there are lots of people with cameras all around it um, in this photo, it really packed people. And then another one on Madison Avenue, a march in New York City uh, in 1993. Both of these photos are by Tom Olin and they're both pretty famous, but particularly the one I'm gonna describe now, which has a crowd of people um, and many of them are in wheelchairs and they're carrying a banner across the top of them that says injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere martin luther king jr dustin dart justin dart is in this photo so is uh judy human and um and it's actually a pretty famous photo but this is 1993 and 94 we already had the ada we're we want enforcement now um just a couple of things that came after the ada that i think are really important in 1999 there was an Olm the olmstead decision which said that no one should have to live in an institution or a nursing home if they can live in the community with the right support. That decision was based on ADA Title II because there were states who, even though um, people were approved to live outside of uh, an institutional setting, 
they they were keeping them in these institutions. So these two women, Elaine Wilson and Lois Curtis, who are pictured on this slide, um, sued, and they uh, and the decision came down that ADA's Title II says that they have to be allowed to live independently or in the most integrated setting appropriate to the needs of qualified individuals' disabilities. This is directly from Title II, and that is the reason that we have uh, the ability for people to get out of institutional settings. There's also a picture here of a young man who is holding up a, a sign that says, I am Olmstead. He's wearing noise, noise canceling headphones. Um, and a lot of people will hold up this sign, people who would have been institutionalized, who are now able to live in the most integrated setting appropriate, which can mean their own homes too. They can live independently. Um, and then in 2008, we had the ADA Amendment Act. What had been happening was that between 1990 and 2007, the US Supreme Court heard 20 ADA count cases and five of them, a quarter of them, narrowed the definition of disability because they were all about, the cases were all about, well, is that really a disability? Is that not a disability? So five of the cases made the, the definition of disability even narrower. Well, the uh, ADA Amendments Act restored the ADA's intent and protections so that the focus is not on whether someone had a disability, but rather on whether discrimination occurred. And the interpretation of what is a disability was considered to be far broader. Um, and, uh, and so it was, so what it was doing was directing the courts to interpret disability in a much broader sense to give broader coverage to the individual rather than nitpicking over whether it's a disability or not and whether it qualifies. In 2010, the ADA Standards of Accessible Design created regulations that set minimal accessibility requirements for any newly designed construction and any, any construction being done to alter a structure or its features. Um, and this covered state and local government as well as private commerce. So what's the impact of the ADA? Well, before the ADA, employers could refuse to hire someone with a disability. People with disabilities could be paid less for the same work. Public areas could be completely unnavigable to anyone who uses mobility devices. Public transit would not allow wheelchairs on in most cities. And so you'd have to travel without your wheelchair if you wanted to take a bus. Restaurants and businesses could refuse service to people with disabilities, could be denied entry to a museum or a library or not be able to get in. Um, and LGBTQ people were also, could be considered disabled and discriminated on the basis of disability before the Americans with Disabilities Act there were indignities in all areas of public life prior to the ADA. Some of the positive impacts, state and local governments <clears throat> have to create transition plans to become uh, up to standards um, in both program accessibility and physical accessibility. They have ADA coordinators now. Public education is far more inclusive. The Olmstead Act passed, or the, the Olmstead decision came down. So there's independent living. There's a legal recourse through enforcement um, if you are discriminated against. There's uh, effective communication and TTY relay services, public transportation. We're not all the way there yet, but we're getting there. There are integrated programs, access to programs and services. There's service animals that are that have access just like the people who need them have access. Employment opportunity, reasonable accommodations in employment, reasonable modifications in service and uh, infrastructure. I mean, accessible parking, curb cuts, a million other things, elevators. Um, so huge, huge advances. Um, However, um, there's equality in theory and equality in practice. So all those things are so much better and there's still disability related civil rights 
violations right and left. Um, and there are there is still uh, more discipline in the school system for people who have disabilities, children with disabilities, than for their non-disabled peers. Um, the criminal justice system has far, far too many people with disabilities compared to the number of people in the who do not have disabilities that go through it. You're far more likely, you're totally overrepresented if, if you're a person with a disability in the criminal justice system. Poverty is higher for people with disabilities. Access to voting is lower for people with disabilities. Employment opportunities are lower and unemployment is higher for people with disabilities. And the high school graduation and college attendance rates are still lower for people with disabilities. So what is next? What's beyond the ADA? Well, legally, in terms of policy focus, we're looking at enforcement and guidance. We're looking at social security for the marriage penalty and work disincentives. How can we address those things? What about guardianship and conservatorship? There's a lot of attention that, on that right now, um, and it needs to be addressed in a better way. Subminimum wage, that's got to be addressed, right? Uh, criminal justice reform. Um, the, the drive, the so-called drive-by Title III lawsuits, which have uh, really shaped public opinion in a negative way in, in many uh, aspects, um, because it's believed that people with disabilities are uh, creating frivolous lawsuits against businesses. There's healthcare, artificial intelligence discrimination, and, um, and more funding, education, infrastructure, technology. I could go on and on and on and on, um, but I haven't got all day and neither do you. So let's get to the, to the bottom line. Um, Jasmine Harris, who is a, a disability um, expert at the uh, University of California, Davis, says the existence of a right to live in the world has proven insufficient on its own to guarantee equal opportunities for people with disabilities. So keep having a disability, I mean, we all know that that doesn't keep people from achieving goals. But when society believes that people with disabilities are useless or unworthy, that keeps us from reaching our goals. And the history of disab disability rights in America has been a fight over and over and over again to be seen as, as equals or even, or even worthy of respect, rights, opportunities, um, the right to live well, to contribute to society. So some people are still afraid uh, of uh, to interact with people with disabilities. Some people are really buy into it. it there's, there's a theory called social Darwinism. And that is about this, this hierarchy of um, that, and it's it definitely related to eugenics, but the idea that, that some groups of people are a little less worthy than others, and then others even less worthy and others even less worthy still. And from that comes ableism and racism. And even within the disability community, disability hierarchies. So there's, and there is, there is still an adherence within this also, and it, it sort of supports it, the custodial approach, which is that we need to take care of people with disabilities because they are less than. Um, and there's also within society, the expectation always of an aesthetic marker of disability, which would be that you can always tell if someone has a disability. So invisible disabilities are not um, acknowledged in, within this structure. There are lingering stereotypes, low expectations of people with disabilities, and that discomfort and fear people being afraid of saying the wrong thing, offending someone, having an uncomfortable conversation, a lack of, for even people with disabilities, having an internalized disability etiquette. Um, and this backlash that people can feel um, that somehow with the advancement of disability rights that, that, they're, that something is being taken away. Um, so we're at this amazing time where this country is having a, a reckoning in, um, in 
particularly in racial justice issues, but it has completely affected also disability justice issues, but it's got to start with people being aware and uh, understanding this is a marginalized community. This is why this is marginalized and what can we do to fix that? How can we see people as, um, as equals? So for me, um, I was asked the question, what do we go from here? Where's the, what's the future of the ADA? Well, honestly, I think that is you can build a million ramps, but if you get to the door and the person on the other side of that door doesn't want you to come in or doesn't recognize that you are like them and, and should even come in, then those, those advances, those ramps really aren't of, of use. We have to change people's uh, hearts and minds. I, it, it's a terrible phrase, but people have to be educated um, and we need to raise disability awareness in order to really make the, the changes that I discussed, um, the legal changes that we might need to address and to change society's view and bring up those employment numbers and bring down those criminal incarceration numbers, et cetera. So the bottom line is real change means moving past simply asking what we need in order to exercise the rights of the ADA that are afforded to us to live in this country. It requires a commitment to determining and building the kind of country that we want to live in. Laws alone cannot bring a marginalized group into society. It takes changed attitudes, changed behavior. And, um, and that's where I think we are right now, actually. This is, this is where I feel like is the time is we need to get back to the mission, the intent of the ADA, inclusion, access, integration, accommodation. Thanks everybody. I don't know if we have time for questions, but if we do, Robin will tell me. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Linda. Oh, that's wonderful. I appreciate the history and the looking forward piece. And I couldn't agree more that you can make however many laws you want, but if the value systems that, uh, that are underlying um, are not ones of inclusion and acceptance, then it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So we do have a few minutes for questions and we've invited folks to put questions into the Q&A sort of feature of uh, Zoom. Um, so feel free to do that if anyone has questions. We've got a couple minutes. Um, and if you don't, that's okay too. I do see that someone said in the chat, will these, uh, will the slide deck be available somehow? We'll figure that out. And um, if you register to attend this event, we have your contact information. And so if we're able to share it somehow, we'll make sure you know. Um, I can absolutely get that as an accessible PDF in probably early next week. I can get that to you. Wonderful, like thank it. you. That mm -hmm. would be great. Thank you so much, Linda. So I don't think that I'm seeing any questions coming up. Oh, um, I do see a question. So I'm going to read it out loud to you, Linda, and see what you think, OK? Mm -hmm. How are we going to change the way forms are accepted in government? I think I need a little clarification. When you say forms, are you talking about um, uh, the need for uh, for better um, technical access in order to be, why, give yeah, tell me more a context bit more about what you need. Let's see, Delia, if you're able to add some more context to that, we'll circle back, okay? So I while, hate forms, I hate yeah. all forms. <laughs> so I, 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 I am, a, um, uh, I have a, had a uh, traumatic brain injury. So that's my, so part of my disabilities, I look at forms and, and I immediately just wanna jump yeah. <laughs> so, um, so what do you mean by forms? Yeah, yeah. Delia, if you're able to add to that, that would be helpful. Meanwhile, Elizabeth has asked, uh, lots of DEI efforts, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion efforts are going towards dismantling racial injustice. Most overlook accessibility and disability issues. Linda, how would you suggest encouraging the inclusion of intersectionality into the DEI equation? Oh my gosh. That's the best question. Um, and that's the thing that I think I spend the most time thinking about because I do, um, I, I, the thing that I do the most training on is uh, disability awareness, um, history, language, 
etiquette and we've started to incorporate um uh it, well for a while now inspiration porn but now ableism is definitely being being uh incorporated into it and intersectionality mm -hmm. um i what i'm seeing is i'm seeing a direct um a, a direct um effect of the uh the racial justice movements that have been happening over the past year plus since since last year um and there is a actually a direct uh line to more and more people asking for disability awareness training and um i think that there is i how do we how do we get people to say well wait what about where's the disability part in the just in the um diversity equity inclusion access uh division of your company well we ask them um we as people with disabilities particularly and as advocates need to say you know it's kind of interesting i haven't seen any training we haven't done it we've done all these trainings on these other things mm -hmm. on lgbtq plus and on 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 um uh most recently um uh american attitudes toward toward asian americans and um of course um toward uh black people and lots of the whole bipoc community um but whoa you know what about people with disabilities did you know we're the largest disability group what can we do about that so i would just say we have to be self-advocates yeah yeah i don't know what else how else do we do that we have to advocate for ourselves if not us then who exactly right. yeah well thank you again linda uh thank you so much for your expertise and your time uh, i truly appreciate it and thank you. Uh, we're going to transition on to the next section of the program um okay i'll stop sharing yeah thank you so uh as an introduction anybody who's been attending our uh, understanding ableism series since the beginning um will remember miss anita whitfield uh, miss anita is king county's director of equity and social justice and she's joining us to tonight to discuss the county's commitment to the disability community uh we've asked her to share updates about what the uh, what the county is working on um and again to just help us see um, and be in partnership with King County as we move forward in this work. So welcome, Miss Anita. We're so glad to see you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Robin, and thank you, Kimberly, for having me back. I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Anita, Anita Louise Whitfield. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I am a black woman with a shaved head. I today am wearing um, long silver earrings and a black dress. I am sitting in front of a poster that says, that has a young black woman um, on it. Her hair is in locks um, and the caption on that poster is we the people protect each other. Happy Disability Pride Month y'all. Happy 31st anniversary of the ADA. Happy coming together in this iteration of this series. So glad to be back with you. On behalf of King County Executive Dow Constantine and on behalf of myself, your servant, I try to be, I thank you, KCDC, and I thank commun the community leaders for voicing the clear need for King County to better serve the over 560,000 people with disabilities in this region. I appreciate, we appreciate that you are holding us accountable um, to stay on this path towards better ADA compliance, accessibility and disability equity 
in King County spaces, services, and programs. For sure, this is critical work and we appreciate the KCDC for their continued partnership as we move forward. So I was asked here today just to share really briefly with you um, a short report out on the steps we are taking to advance this important work. So let me try to do that for you um, in a, a brief way. Uh, hold on, here I come. Thank you for your patience. Um, so some of what we have done, we've hired a disability specialist who has been on board addressing disability equity and ADA gaps, especially related to the COVID response, which we know has impacted the disability community greatly. Next, um, we have, we be in the Office of Equity and Social Justice, um, have launched a new county equity cabinet. It's a group of diverse, community members um, that will work to advise the county um, on how to ensure policies, practices, programs, outcomes align with our stated values. And I'm proud to have several leaders from the disability community on that equity cabinet. Next, uh, we are I would say in the final stages of partnering with King County employees to create an official, King County's first official disability affinity group. Uh, our affinity groups provide a space of safety and affinity of life experience. It is a space for county employees to connect and to together help to influence the county on, in this case, important disability equity issues. So far, there are 28 employees who have expressed a strong interest in joining this new group. And we hope that we will have our first official meeting of this, of the disability affinity group at the end of this summer. Uh, I'd like to share with you also that uh, we have reestablished what is known as the ADA Liaison Network. That is um, a group across the departments in King County, um, beginning with the executive branch, um, to assess accessibility and ADA compliance issues. Their work will help to inform the county strategies and our priorities to meet the requirements of the ADA and more. Uh, another thing that I'm very glad about is we were successful in bringing on epiphanies of equity and, uh, and Christiana, those of you who know Christiana will understand why we are so glad to have them working with us. Uh, I'd like to share with you just a couple other things if I might, and I'm watching the time here. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, we submitted to the King County Council what is known as the Disability Equity action plan. Uh, that plan is a major step for us. It will significantly increase the capacity within King County um, related to addressing ADA and disability equity issues. And I'm so glad that we have reached that milestone. Couple last things, um, we are restructuring our 504 ADA committee. Uh, we are adding new staff to our um, OESJ team uh, to um, serve the disability community. Um, 
we will be purposefully and intentionally incorporating disability into the next iteration, iteration, excuse me, into the next iteration of the King County Equity and Social Justice Strategic Plan, and that is major. Lastly, um, I would say that, um, yeah, other work being done, but I hope that y'all can see that we have made progress from the, the last time I was with you, which was the first edition of this important series. I'm proud of the work we've done, but it is just, hmm, what word would I use? It is just the beginning of the down payment that is due to the disability community. Mm. I will say this and I will end. Our work with the disability community advocates have changed me. It has changed me. So I thank you all for that. In closing, I would say on behalf of King County Executive Dow Constantine and myself and the team in OESJ, it is our honor to serve the county's disability community towards truly reaching its North Star, which is making King County, both the government and the region, a welcoming place where all people, all people can thrive. I thank you. I honor you. Thank you. Wow, um, I'm a little choked up. Uh, thank you so much, Anita. Truly appreciate your words and the vision of King County. It's uplifting to know where we started 16, 17 months ago uh, to see where we have gotten today. It's truly inspiring and um, we couldn't have done it without the disability community behind us. Um, Robin and I, um, we saw a need and filled the need uh, to quote the movie Robots, <laughs> but uh, it wasn't something that we did alone. We had to do it with community in order for it to be as effective as it has been. And that's represented in the over 40 organizations that signed our letter and the nearly 100 dis individuals with disabilities and, and advocates who also signed the letter that we submitted um, to King County. And I'm honored every day to be able to continue working on this process because I see progress uh, and that's inspiring. Thank you, Kimberly, appreciate you. Robin, I just wanted to invite you just for a quick second if you wanted to say any words. Oh gosh, this is Robin. I, It's hard to put into words the feelings. Uh, I put in the chat that my heart is full, Miss Anita, and I am just truly thankful. Uh, we have come a long way. And like you said, this is just, a, I appreciate it, the down payment, right, for, for things that are due. Um, but I appreciate that recognition and honoring, um, honoring the community and that commitment to continuing this hard work. So thank you so much for your words and your presence and your commitment and your love. Robin, thank you, community. This is Kimberly again. We have so many thank yous to give today. I, I can't begin to name everybody one by one, uh, but we'd like to thank the members of the King County Disability Consortium 
for standing with us as we walk through this process. And thank you to the disability community for uniting your voice for change. Thank you to Linda Clement Carp and Northwest ADA for the awesome presentation about the ADA. Uh, you actually had some things in there that I didn't know. Um, thank you to Anita Whitfield, uh, Council Member Zahalai Cole Wells for joining us, and Council Members Up the Grove and Lambert for sharing the reaffirmation of the county's commitment towards the ADA and disability access, equity, and inclusion. A special thank you to the uh, individuals who provided videos to us, uh, Jason Lambert, uh, Jason Todd Morris, and Doreen Cornwell. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, as a reminder, this event was recorded and can be viewed on the King County Disability Consortium webpage at www.kingcountydisability.org forward slash webinars. In August, we'll be back to the third Thursday schedule. Uh, this one was a little later this month in order to accommodate uh, the proclamation. Um, so on August 19th, uh, we'll be back with our next Understanding Ableism uh, in the series. Uh, it will be number eight, and we'll focus on Understanding Ableism in Reproductive Rights. And if nobody else has anything that they'd like to add, um, thank you, Kayla. Uh, the, website is in the chat for individuals who'd like to access the recordings of this event as well as uh, all of our past events. Go ahead, Robin. I just wanted to add that I think to today and the purpose of today was a chance to reflect in joy and of reflect in accomplishment. So I hope that everyone is able to go on in their evening and enjoy and have a sense of accomplishment and, and hope uh, for everything that we're doing together. And thank you everybody for joining us and this will actually end the presentation. So have a great evening, uh, stay cool and enjoy the sunshine. Take care. <laughs>